It's This Week in Creationism, episode number 25. I'm your host, Joel Duff, and here we take a look at the headlines in the world of creationism from this past week. Just a couple items that we're going to focus on this week. We've got dino extinction in the spring, flightless by design, not mutation, soft tissue fail once again. We've got that and a couple more things coming up. All right, we're going to start with Answers in Genesis. Um, I don't often cover the material that they do in their Answers News programs. So twice a week they have a program called Answers News, which is a live program on Facebook and now on YouTube as well. Uh, I usually go back and scan through and, and see some of the things they've talked about. But as you will see in just a moment, uh, they're not usually topics that I'm interested in since we're, we're generally focusing here on um, science and faith and, and usually emphasizing some of their interactions with scientific stories. And since they don't talk about scientific stories very much, that's one of the reasons why you're not seeing that appear on This Week in Creationism. Um, so here, but here's last week's uh, episode. And you can see right from the title here, this one trend is causing divorce rates to soar. Um, the, the fact that they're using that as their title the thing that they want people to see and, and hopefully are attracting people to watch the episode uh, tells you a little bit about uh, their emphasis, right, as an apologetics ministry right now um, versus emphasizing any sort of science story. And this is this is typically what happens uh, with this news thing. In fact, I'll show you here are the links that they provide for the stories that they talk about in this particular episode, which is usually about an hour long. Right. Uh, they talk about cargo ships and luxury cars sinking, cohabitation. That's that's where the title comes from. Um, Supreme Court uh, uh, L LGBT rulings, uh, educators being slammed for this is basically a CRT thing. Um, you know, talking about Black Lives Matters. Uh, and then down at the bottom here, we've got ultra precise atomic clock experiments confirm Einstein's predictions about time just fine. They don't really have a problem with that. It's just an interesting story to them. Let me back up. And the one I skipped, of course, was we now know exactly when the dinosaurs went extinct. And that's kind of a sarcastic title because that's not what they believe. Um, and so I was interested in, in what they had to say about that. I listened to the four or five minutes that they devoted to this particular story. And it's uh, you know, I have to say it's the same stuff. It's it's sort of like uh, scientists say this, but hey, this was a long time ago. So were they there? And they literally do say that. How do they know they weren't there? So how could they know when the dinosaurs went extinct? And what the story is about, it's actually an intriguing article. Uh, it's provides evidence of the time of year when the dinosaur extinction happened. Now, I, I'm actually oversimplifying that. It's not really the dinosaur extinction. No, it's when the mass extinction event occurred at the KPG boundary, about 60, and dated conventionally to 66 million years. That uh, particular time period has been shown through the fossil record in many places in the world. So there's to have been a time of incredible extinction where a uh, large percentage of the species, genera, and even families of organisms on Earth disappear. So their fossils are below that point, and then they disappear, and they're not present above that. And the question has been, is in this large asteroid explosion in the Yucatan Peninsula has often been one of the primary culprits, all right, been blamed for this extinction event. And that particular uh, asteroid event, the effects of that have now been observed in a couple of famous locations, but one in particular in uh, northern, uh, th in the northern hemisphere. And that's what this paper is going to talk about. That particular location has uh, remnants of the force of impact of that explosion down in the southern hemisphere and shows fossils that have been collected at that very moment. And so by looking at the evidence from those fossils, it can be determined, I think, uh, I'm convinced by the data, I'll put it that way, and I think the majority of the scientific community is, uh, you can be convinced of the time of year in which that explosion occurred. Uh, now, this certainly doesn't work within the Young Earth framework because, of course, that particular uh, point in time in the fossil record for young earth creationist is the very end well for answers in genesis remember i've been talking a lot about the flood boundary 
and there's huge disagreements among creationists about where the flood post-flood boundary is but for answers in genesis the flood post-flood boundary is right about at that point uh, and so it wouldn't be recording the time of year in which that particular event occurred because all the fossils that are there are fossils that were picked up from the when the flood started to begin which would have been a year earlier so that doesn't really make that wouldn't make any sense in their uh, worldview to actually describe fossils as the timing of them at that particular moment because they're all just part of a large slurry of stuff that's being spread all over the earth and settled uh, settling into various rock layers. All right, I'm, I'm going too far down this path of talking about uh, that extinction event. That's not actually critical for what I want to bring out here. Um, I'm more interested in how they come up with these stories and how they respond to them. So what they are responding to is this particular link from Tweak Town, which I had never heard of. It's an Australian, mostly a technology uh, site, but technology and some science technology, right? And this is where that story is posted. Now we know exactly when the dinosaurs went extinct. And on answers news as they talk about this article uh, they clearly are only talking about this very short five paragraph article that it just it is describing an article in nature right the journal nature one of the top science journals in the world it's pretty obvious they haven't read the original article it the article uh, talks about um, how fish bones can be used to determine the timing of when they died uh, because fish lay down certain layers of, of uh, bony material uh, in, a, in a seasonal pattern. Uh, and so if you look at a whole bunch of fish bones from different fish, which is what they did from this collection of fish that were thrown chaotically together uh, in this uh, asteroid explosion, they identify the timing of their bone production, and that's how they identify the fact that in the northern hemisphere, it was during the spring, early spring, that this event occurred. Whereas in the southern hemisphere, it would have been in the uh, late fall, I guess. They're talking about that, and they just kind of, well, you know, this can't be, how do they know? They weren't there. All the standard answers in Genesis lines are applied to this. And by not really delving into the data, not actually talking about the data, not informing their audience about the evidence, um, it allows them to sort of stay at this really high level of just talking in very big generalities, which allows them to apply their general responses to everything. Um, it's it completely uninformative, really, other than just being able to tell their audience, you don't need to pay attention to this because this whole asteroid explosion thing, although there might be something to that, you certainly can't tell anything about fossilization and, and all these things from that data. But I want to push this a little bit farther. All right, so I don't understand how they find these sources. I mean, here this is an, a rather obscure, I think obscure, uh, Australian website. They find this article that is just a snapshot of a, a very important article in Nature. Uh, they could have found other more reputable science news outlets that would have given them a much better summary of the data. They don't seem to be interested in interesting, interesting summary. In fact, they make fun of this particular article because they talk about how clickbaity the title is, how you can't trust science news because they're always just trying to make you think that for sure we know when they went extinct, right? So they're criticizing this particular article for being so, um, you know, not acting like it's a hypothesis, but just acting like it's the truth. Well, I mean, that's what you're going to get when you look at a clickbait sort of um, location, right? I mean, that's, that's what you should expect. And so, yeah, I'm not happy either with the titles that I see on, art, on, on science news articles because I'm often disappointed by, you know, the title leads you to believe something, you read the article, it's not quite that accurate. But in this case, you read the Nature article, and it's actually far more convincing, far more interesting than this article actually makes it out to be. Uh, and I wish they had read it. Here it is. The Mesozoic uh, terminated in Boreal Spring, which is a, which is a very strong statement. Um, down here at the end, 
in the abstract that say we postulate that the timing of the Chicks Club impact, which is the one on the Yucatan Peninsula, was in boreal spring and austral autumn, meaning south, the southern hemisphere, uh, autumn. And what really made this paper interesting when I, when I looked at it was that uh, what I got out of it more so than the timing, because I already knew about this timing and they should have known too, because this is just a follow-up paper on a really huge paper that made a lot of news a year ago that Answers in Genesis covered already about this particular fossil location, which looks like a, uh, it's a seach deposit it's called. So it, the water from the river was pushed upstream because of the force of the, the, um, the, the explosive event all the way into North America, pushing this water and then collecting all these fish and then pushing that up on land and mixing it with a bunch of other stuff and depositing it there. And then later other material was put on top. And so we have this like compact region of a couple, like a meter thick of stuff that is like the, you know, the, the actual physical remains of identifying that event occurring. And so it's a fantastic uh, site that has been described in a couple papers and this is just a paper that's only describing the fish all right it's only looking at very fine details of fish bones because they have so many fish from different species and therefore they can do a bunch of statistical studies with it and so they come to a even stronger conclusion than the original authors did looking at other data but had answers in genesis and these three that are talking about it on answers news had they gone back not only read this paper but then recognized it's connected to that other paper. And that other paper has a whole list of, of different types of data that support a timing in terms of when this occurred. The earth was in this particular state at the very moment this impact occurred. And it includes things like, hey, the, there was brand new pollen from plants that typically produce their pollen in the spring. And that's the type of pollen that was in the water. And so it was deposited along with these fish. Um, and there's a number of other things that you would think about, like here's what the biotic condition would be in spring, and that's the type of organisms and things you find there. Whereas if you go to the southern hemisphere, then you find something different. That in itself is really interesting and fascinating uh, way to think about things. So unlike what Answers in Genesis says about like, well, no one was there. Like since you didn't see it, how do you know it happened in the spring? Well, there's a whole bunch of evidence lying around that we're able to interpret to come to very reasonable conclusions, not unlike going to a crime scene, right? And seeing the bullet and seeing uh, where it impacted and you weren't there. You didn't actually see the bullet do its damage, but it's uh, clear from the bullet and how it's been damaged that it went through this particular material and you see the hole in the wall. It's not an unreasonable conclusion to come to if you hypothesize where that bullet came from and what happened. Uh, and that's a past event that you're recreating, you know, from the circumstantial evidence. All right, let's move on. Let's go to Institute for Creation Research, where they are continuing. Well, this is a broken record theme from many, many weeks here on uh, This Week in Creationism. It's continuing to push back against the evils of natural selection, right? ICR is, they're on a mission. They're on a mission to wipe the, the, the use of the term natural selection out of the creationist vocabulary, right? Don't want young earth creationists using that or applying uh, natural selection as a mechanism or a process. Actually, mechanism is a bad word for that. There's a process that occurs, that, that happens in this world that can affect organisms and uh, provide their ability and help them to adapt to this environment. All right, and so here we see another example. Flightless by design or designed by death? Now talk about a kind of a clickbaity title, right? Designed by death, right? Well, who wants to say something's designed by death? That sounds really horrible. And so they're giving you a dichotomy, right? A, 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 a choice between two different positions. They're either birds that can't fly are either flightless by design or they're designed by death. All right. Well, what are you going to choose? 
right? Design sounds a whole lot nicer than, than simply death making things. Can death make things? But this is the way that they are going to present natural selection, right? This is how, they, this is how they're talking about natural selection. Natural selection is designing things by dying. It requires death to occur for it to do anything. And death is always bad. Can't accept death in this world as a normal process. And so therefore, uh, we shouldn't be accepting natural selection as a process that God would have ordained, right? That God would have uh, provided for organisms to adapt to their environment. Uh, if you just look at the article highlights here, why would flightless birds live along flying birds if evolutionary forces were play in both? All right, so this that's a slightly different idea, but that's a, uh, this is another thing that they they push. You have a maybe a similar environment. You have flightless birds and non-flightless birds. If if the environment were selecting for flightlessness, then why aren't all the birds in that area flightless? I think this is just a gross misunderstanding of biology, not understanding that even in a similar environment, there are different niches, that different birds take advantage of different food sources, that different predators uh, have, like, well, for example, birds in some areas can lay eggs on the ground versus in trees versus out on the rocks, right? And that results in them actually experiencing different environments. If they're experiencing different environments, natural selection is acting in, in pressuring the characteristics of those organisms differently in those different locations. So it's not surprising that you'd have birds and other organisms that take on different characteristics in the same general region, same general area. But back to this natural selection thing and the design. The flightless rail lives on islands where it needs, where it has no need of flight. Okay, it's a reasonable observation. There are a lot of uh, islands, remote islands that have flightless birds. Um, and that, you know, makes sense. I mean, if, because there's no predators there, potentially, right? If there's no predators on an island, then there isn't a need to escape the predator. And if you can find your food source on the ground, you don't have any need for flight. That sounds to me like, a, you know, a nice natural selection story, right? Bird flies to island, bird grows into population, birds are able to fly. Uh, but they can find, but there's plenty of food source on the ground. They experience some mutations that um, reduce their capacity for flight, but that doesn't hurt the birds because they can get plenty of food and they're not being threatened. Uh, and and actually, in in this article, they talk about how well being able to fly is such a perfect trait. All right, such an awesome trait. Why would you ever lose that? That's not how natural selection functions, though. If you're, if in your environment, not flying gives you a better ability to survive and have offspring, right? Allows you to get more food, allows you to have better offspring because you can devote more energy to your offspring. Then that is the best characteristic you can have, not flying. Being able to fly is a negative trait in that habitat because it takes a lot of energy to fly, right? You have large wings. A enormous amount of energy devoted to flight and if flying doesn't help you get more food and have more offspring then flying is not the best trait for that that environment it's not the perfect trait it's an imperfect trait in an environment where wings aren't necessary uh, and I think that's just one of the things that they uh, you know fail to see consistently uh, in this is that they are thinking of characteristics abstractly, not within a particular context. And natural selection is all about the context in which you live. That determines fitness. A wing is only fit if it's actually involved in helping the organism procure more food and be a better survivor, have more offspring, than another situation where that wing is less fit because it actually gets in way of doing that your neighbors aren't able to fly, they're more successful than you are, right? So they then can pass their, their information, right? Their genes to the next generation more frequently because they are better survivors. And therefore the next generation is going to share that particular information, which tells them you don't have to fly and be very successful in this next environment. 
So um, now what, what's interesting here is that Institute for Creation Research actually calls what I just said designate is, is that's being designed by death because they view it as the one that's less fit dies and doesn't you know doesn't spread its its genes the next uh, generation uh, and they they don't see those characteristics as being bad right being able to fly is good but if it, you know because it's God created things you know and if he created it, it must be good it must be must be perfect and therefore to say that something's going to die because that's a perfect trait in order to to help other organisms survive better that don't have that perfect trait well then what are you doing you're designing by death so they flip it around it clearly this is kind of what's happening but if you flip it around and you say that or you know um god designed the ability to be some for some birds to be flightless or not flightless and but they have that design in them already and they're simply um they're engineered to do that and so they're simply choosing one or one of those programs or the other program depending on the environment to make them better for that particular environment so they're saying it's not the in <laughs> this is hard to explain because it still sounds like the environment is selecting which of those programs to use but they view it as the programs are looking at the environment deciding here this is the program i'm going to use that's best for that environment and this was created by god originally so therefore it's designed to do that it's designed to be flightless and mutations can't happen oh so we get to flightlessness is not caused by a mutation it is designed an innate attribute that helps rails thrive Whereas these rails that can fly in other places but they don't fly in this island it's not because they had a mutation it's not because they had any variant created by a mutation it's because they were already designed with the ability to do either flight or no flight and they simply have chosen not to fly on the islands because that is a better design there than it would be on the mainland. If that sounds like natural selection, that's because it is natural selection. <laughs> it's, like, it's still natural selection. Um, they just don't want to call it that. Let's just read a small portion of this relatively short article to give you a flavor for the, the, the mental... Um, gymnastics that have to occur here to try to avoid calling this natural selection. Um, one such bird is the white-throated rail. Years ago, uh, years ago, ten thousands, thousands and thousands of years ago, but they're not going to say that, this rail flew to a small island and then the unthinkable, it became flightless. Flight is such an incredibly beneficial ability to possess. Why would a bird ever give it up? All right, so here's here's this idea that, I mean, God gave birds flight, and it's so incredibly useful and beneficial. Giving that up seems like a like a you know it, it seems to the average person that that would be something you would never give up, right? Why would you stop doing something that's so awesome? So how are we going to explain that? Many believe this bird didn't become flightless by design. All right, so those who aren't us. You know, they try to describe it to something else. They, natural selection, this other force, right, that isn't, that isn't God, that isn't, that isn't Jesus, as they start out the article with. They surmise instead that a random genetic mistake disabled it, and flying birds were at a competitive disadvantage to survive, thus populating the island with flightless birds only. That's actually a pretty good description. All right, birds fly to an island, on that island, they are every time they copy their genome, they're going to make mistakes. I mean, even Institute of Creation Research can't deny that mistakes happen, right? In fact, they talk about genetic entropy. They talk about things breaking, right? I don't understand why they can't say that the genes that make flight, you know, the, the, the flight feathers and involved in the development of the wing and the wing length Right, and there's actually the muscle structure and the bones in the breast that uh, involved in the flight muscles. If you have mutations that grow smaller muscles that grow shorter wings, they're eventually not gonna fly as well. They don't necessarily have one mutation, suddenly they can't fly at all. It's usually a buildup of many, many different mutations, which completely fits with their genetic entropy idea that the genome is decaying. It only makes sense that if you're in a location, your genome's decaying, 
And if it's decaying, you're losing, you're losing the ability to have losing traits, right? If you lose a trait and it becomes beneficial because now you're living on the ground and there's plenty of resources and you don't need to fly, well, then not flying is a beneficial trait because, it t like I said before, it takes a lot of energy. If you no longer can fly because you have the mutation, your neighbor is flying still because they don't have this new mutation that you have, they're spending a lot of energy. What if they're making a nest up in the tree still, like they did in the mainland to avoid a predator? Um, and you have mutations in which your behavior has changed and you are making your nest on the ground. Uh, they're expending a lot of energy making a nest up in the tree, which is much harder to do. You're making a nest on the ground. Chances are you're going to be able to lay more eggs, right? And you're going to lay healthier eggs because you have more energy, and then you're going to have more offspring. And then you're going to spread that particular mutation to the next generation. It'll become more common, and there'll be more birds that were flightless and having their eggs on the ground than they did up in the trees before. Um, this is a pretty straightforward and easily testable and observable idea. And to say that this didn't occur by mutations, when Institute for Creation Research has a, 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 a rationale for saying that, I think the problem here is that they recognize that flightlessness is a positive trait. It's a beneficial trait on a, on a, on a remote island. And if it's a beneficial trait, that would be like saying that a mutation causes a beneficial trait right that the birds evolved to become flightless which actually is better adapted for that particular location uh, and they did it through mutation so rather than do that they're going to say that this was a program inside of them that god made for rails not necessarily for every bird so they're going to say not every bird could become flightless um, I don't know how they get around that there could be mutations in birds that just knock out flight, but maybe they're going to say those are exceptions. But anyway, the, the rail somehow has this design built into them that allows them to be either flighted or flightless. God knowing that someday there would be these islands after the flood that didn't have predators on them, but would have plenty of resource and knew the rails would be there, gave them this program that when they got there, they could express that program. Now, unfortunately, they still have a problem. There's still a problem here. Even if they express that program and they, they're not doing it as individuals, I, you know, I don't see, I don't see how uh, a bird that is flying says, okay, I, I know maybe what I see are saying is there's a bird that has flight and they're like, Hey, I got plenty of energy. Uh, and I don't have to fly to get this food. And somehow that triggers something. Wow, it sounds like the environment triggering it again, but you know, they're going to say some internal sensor allows them to recognize that this, this area is different. And then they trigger that sensor, and then in their offspring, they turn on like this other program so that their offspring will be flightless. And they're not going to call that a mutation. They're going to say that that, that, that that little switch was already there, and it was just flipped. The problem with all this is that they're there are lots of studies. There's lots of places where there are flightless birds or partially flightless birds or birds that don't fly very well, like cormorants in some places. And you can see the progression. It's not like they're, they have flight and then they completely lose flight. They have flight and then they're intermediate stages. And all those intermediate stages are governed by small incremental mutations that are building up and causing the decay of that particular trait. Or a better way of putting it is, they're adapting their wings to be better for something else, like swimming, like cormorants, right? Like penguins, they're super good swimmers, but they have mutations that allow them to lock their bone, arm bones in place to keep, to make that, to make the paddles so that they're better swimmers. Um, yeah, so, okay, so continuing on here, all these changes have been observed repeatedly with rails, changes that make them flightless, but allow them to remain on the island uh, when the food is source. So what they're, what they're really looking at with rails, and they've picked this particular example because this is, these are fairly recent adaptations and there are rails that are flighted and ones that are flightless. Um, but he's ignoring an enormous database of many other birds <laughs> that are flightless 
that this explanation he's going to use here doesn't work at all. Um, so the bird, uh, let's go down to this last paragraph because I'm, I'm going on too long. So birds have built-in sensors and systems to optimize bone wing length to altitude. So here's this engineering language, right? Built-in sensors and systems to optimize bird bone length to altitude. Evolutionists mistake this ability for the source of flightlessness. They extrapolate this capacity far forward to apply to the rail. Their selectionist interpretive framework leads them to miss seeing data indicating that flightlessness is a purposefully engineered innate response to conserve energy. Agree, it, you know, flightlessness does conserve energy. But here's the thing, if you took a hundred flighted birds and put them on an island, would they suddenly stop flying because, they, because their innate programs, right? Their innate response tells them to? No, it's still, they're not saying that. They're still saying if you took those birds and then allowed them to reproduce, some of their offspring would be less able to fly. Now they might say that that's an innate thing, but that's part of their genetic variation. Where did that genetic variation come from, right? Ultimately, you're gonna find mutations, right? That are responsible for making some of those variants that cause them not to have flight. So last line here, rails are engineered to be flightless if needed so they can thrive on a faraway tiny island and thereby fill the earth just like Jesus designed them to do so. So their flightlessness was specifically designed in the beginning, I guess before the fall, knowing that there would be sin in this world, although that brings in genetic entropy according to creationists, so I still don't understand how they get away from the whole, there are tons of mutations and they are, mutations are decaying organisms and causing them to lose traits seems like a perfectly reasonable explanation they could apply with their own their own words but no in this case this is too good like you know th they end up with a with a positive trait so they can't blame it on genetic entropy it's got to be this was created originally in the original creation all right uh, this is just one of over and over and over and over just basically applying the same language to every organism they come across um, and uh, Randy Guliuza uh, just did a video. I, I, maybe if I remember, I'll try to link it. He just did a video in which he talks for a half hour about the problems with natural selection, you know, a very philosophical level of what's, what's, uh, why it's so evil. And uh, it's probably the best, his best attempt so far. I, mean, I have to admit, I watch it and it's still not clear to me um, how he gets around natural selection being a real force in this world. All right, that brings me to <laughs> yeah, somebody I've never mentioned uh, on here and I rarely will mention because this is the, the outer fringe, all right, of young earth creationism. So this isn't really headlines in creationism because I think of that as like the main institutions of or uh, apologetics ministries that have the most influence. But there are a few fringe players out there. Uh, the, one, the main one is Kent Hovind, who is... Uh, who is both theologically uh, quite uh, quite fringe in Christianity and yet has a huge following uh, for his young earth creationist uh, ramblings and uh, we'll just say that he's uh, flamboyant in his um, exaggerations of young earth creationist literature. So he takes what other creationists have, have learned and then spices it up with uh, additional exaggeration or misunderstanding. I'll, I'll call it mostly complete misunderstanding uh, of science. And he has spun off a generation of wannabes, all right? People that want to be the next Ken Hovind because Ken Hovind has a huge following um, and he attracts a lot of followers. I mean, his YouTube channel has, has an enormous number of followers. And so he has influence in that way in, in certain segments of the creationist world. Unfortunately, because Answers in Genesis, ICR, CMI, and what we're going to call kind of the legitimate, serious young earth creationist organizations, at one time, many of them had warned against some of the more flamboyant errors of Kent Hovind, but now they just seem to accept, you know, his presence out there. And I think it's sort of like you know, more people talking about creationism, the better, even if they're wrong. But I'll say that Ken Hovind is a product 
of young earth creationism because because the type of thinking that uh, and the type of evidence and the type of way that young earth creationists like unanswers news by talking very broadly and not getting into specifics and not really researching they have generated a a another generation of people that are even have less critical thought <laughs> in this way and so these wannabes these Kent Hovind wannabes um, have created uh, their own YouTube channels and stations. So here we have Matt Powell, and he just posted a video today, the best proof that dinosaurs lived in the recent past. And it's mostly about soft tissue. Um, and this is something that young earth creationist organizations have on their list of like top 10 reasons why the earth is young, is young earth, uh, that there's soft tissue preservation in dinosaur bones. And so somebody like Pat, Matt Hap. Matt Powell, who is a definitely a Ken Hovind wannabe, wants to be the next Ken Hovind when Ken Hovind finally leaves this earth, right? He um, makes these videos that are very Ken Hovind-like in terms of their exaggeration of that data. So I think I think the way that Answers in Genesis describes young, you know, soft tissue preservation and fossils is very poor okay it does not reflect the scientific literature they they don't give very accurate descriptions and that therefore lends other people other young earth creationists who read it to have false impressions so i think some of the young earth creationists they kind of they kind of understand some of the nuances but in order to make it simple for the audience like on answers and news they just use general terms and because they use general terms they give them they give a misimpression to their audience and then other creationists like this pick that up and because they misunderstood right from the very beginning and they want to be even more flamboyant and, and be stronger in the message they tend to make it even worse because they exaggerate the exaggeration of the data right without ever going back to check source data which they're terrible at doing that horrible and so they're propagating those errors to an even greater extent all right, that's why Answers in Genesis has a responsibility to be far more clear because they're being counted on by other creationists who only use them as source literature. So it's error propagates error, propagates error, and it gets worse and worse and worse down the line until you get to people like this, right? Who, who have no clue sometimes about what they're saying, even though they think they're speaking truth because they think that's what they heard from Answers in Genesis. All right, so what is my major beef today with uh, Matt Powell? I'm only going to pick out one thing. He talks about a bunch of different soft tissue preservation, and he's wrong about every single point. But I'm just going to go to one, and I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you, and maybe them if they ever see this, that every single time that they say this, I'm going to point it out. Okay, because I just it drives me crazy. And I'm just going to point it out every time I see it so you can see how often these errors get perpetuated. In this video, right about this point, he's listing off different soft tissues that have been found, different cells that have been found. He talks about how there's blood vessels, there's been blood cells that have been found. Okay, wrong, wrong. Um, there are fossilized remains, potentially, of blood cells, but the actual blood cells not found. Um, and then he says hemoglobin. Right? It says, and they found hemoglobin uh, preserved in dinosaur bones. And then he goes on to talk about how these things couldn't last a very long time. Hemoglobin, you know, can't survive for long periods of time. What's wrong with that statement? They did not find hemoglobin. There's no paper, no research that he can go to in the original literature in which somebody says, we have found preserved, the hemoglobin molecule preserved. It'd be more accurate for him to say, and this is what I want young earth creationists to say, if they don't want to give a misimpression to their audience, if they don't want, and I'll say it more strong, if they don't want to lie to their audience, okay, they need to say this, all right? They need to say that the decayed remnants, all right, decayed and modified remains of the hemoglobin molecule have been found preserved in dinosaur fossils, or in this case, in the belly of a preserved mosquito. Now, I know that's not as sexy, but it's more accurate. And that's what this, I've shown this picture times before, and I'm gonna to continue to show something like this every time somebody mentions this hemoglobin thing. 
So here's a hemoglobin molecule. It's a large, complex protein, all right? Uh, and so this protein has thousands of amino acids in it, and bound to that protein are these, to this, which is, the whole thing is called hemoglobin, and in hemoglobin, it's a protein that has this heme molecule bound to it, right? And this is the heme molecule. It's a, this is a cyclical carbon uh, compound with, a, with an iron atom in it. Now, what happens in the fossilization process and happens in this mosquito and as what has been observed in dinosaur bones is that the protein portion is completely decayed, right? All those amino acids, gone, right? So uh, this lack of the shaded area here is all the stuff that's missing in the fossilized hemoglobin. And then the heme itself is a much more stable molecule by virtue of its, its strong bonding right? I mean, think about oil. I mean, oil is a carbon compound, and it survives for hundreds of millions of years in this very simple state. So molecules can get to a point, biomolecules can get to a point where they're extremely stable. The amino acids, not stable. The heme molecule, relatively stable, but it undergoes chemical degradation over time. And so eventually the side arms, the side chains are lost, and you end up with what's called the heme product, right? It's the decayed product of the heme molecule, which is a portion of the hemoglobin molecule, or the hemoglobin molecule. So what's left, what is actually observed in dinosaur bones is the remains of the heme, the heme product is what's found there. It'd be more accurate to say, or you could say, and I'd like them to say, is that in dinosaurs bones there is evidence that there had been hemoglobin present in that molecule because there are a small portion of the hemoglobin molecule that has decayed and been preserved again that's kind of a that's a big mouthful of stuff but you know what happens when you tell your audience like Matt Powell just did that there are blood cells it found in dinosaur bones and that there is hemoglobin in dinosaur bones, they think that that's like, hey, just like the hemoglobin I have, just like the cells that I have, and they're still there. No, they're the fossilized remains of those things. And that opens up the whole question of like, well, if they're fossilized, like what parts are there? What process did they go through to get fossilized? And how long can that fossilized product last in the environment? Obviously blood cells, are not going to last in their exact condition they're in, but by making it sound like there's blood cells there, he's deceiving his audience. That's, that's all it is. It's deception. Now, I will say that Matt Powell is deceived, and because he doesn't do original research, he remains in a state of deception. Uh, and being in a state of deception, he's, all he can do is deceive others. Right? And that's the problem with these fringe players that are the Kent Hope and wannabes is that they are very much deceived by other young earth creationists who may not be intentionally deceiving. They just, by virtue of the fact that they're simplifying and maybe they don't understand the data very well themselves, they create this gap of knowledge that then is perpetuated, made even worse by the fringe players who just take this as gospel truth, right? And then they just act like, well, how could you possibly believe that these fossils are old? Because there's blood there. There's, there's hemoglobin in those things, right? And it takes a while to, you can't explain in a, in a, in a tweet or a, a chat that uh, they're completely wrong and explain this whole process. And even here, I've spent too much time talking about it and I'm losing half of my listeners but I really need to talk about it for several more hours, all right, to try to get an even better understanding of all the different variables involved in this process and then talk about how long these things can last, all that stuff, right? Well, I do have another video that, that does do some of that. So just a warning, every time I hear the word hemoglobin and it sounds like somebody thinks that actual hemoglobin has been found and preserved in dinosaur bones, I'm going to be showing them this particular figure. Just a fun item to end up with. Ken Ham has uh, reiterated the fact that they are in the process of designing the Tower of Babel, right? 
Answers in Genesis is going to rebuild the Tower of Babel. Of course, they're not going to really rebuild the Tower of Babel, but they're building a representation of the Tower of Babel. It still boggles my mind that anyone thinks this is a good idea. And not only that, we find out it's actually hoping to be an amusement ride. Not just something to look at or walk through, but a, an actual ride. It's kind of like a, it's a small world after all, or you know something like that, right? Magic Mountain, where you're going to sit in a, well, there's a video, and in the video they talk about, uh, you know, the potential to ride through history, right? And so you're you're in this cart and you actually move through this building and then you see the unfolding of history and how evil man became, uh, you know, probably the flood and then this post-flood world and then the gathering at Babel. And the, the goal apparently of the whole thing is to really talk about race and race relations and how we're all one people, one kind. And um, um, you know, I don't have a problem with that, but uh, the, the whole you know, making an amusement ride out of the Tower of Babel and Noah's Flood just, yeah, talk about, uh, you know, what, the, what, those, what, what I started out with, which was Answers News and them complaining about clickbait, right, and trying to just draw readers in, right, with, well, here they're just trying to draw visitors into, the, into their facility um, with fun rides, which actually I don't think it's going to be very, very fun to, to watch the decay of humanity and uh, the destruction of humanity. Um, yeah, I don't even know what else to say about this. Uh, but I just bring it to you as a piece of information to uh, interpret for yourself, and I'll provide the link, and you can go check out what they have to say about the coming attraction, the Tower of Babel, uh, coming to the Ark Encounter soon, actually probably two years. This is one of their sort of last major items that they had ever planned. So if you go way back to their original plans um, before they started the construction of the Ark, I mean, all of this was there and they're really doing it all. Um, it's really going to build out the infrastructure. I don't know how they're going to, I mean, you, you know, the more things you build, this is going to require an enormous amount of, it's more employees and it's a lot more energy, right, space, temperature control, all that stuff. So the basic footprint of cost of the Ark Encounter just continues to increase, which then puts pressure on them to do what? Find more people to come. And that might be part of their their campaign that seems to be just ever growing stronger about getting people to come. And also it might slightly be part of the attacks on Biologos and other organizations, right? Which seem to be chipping away at their audience. And so they're really trying to defend their primary audience because they need them to come pay the bucks so they can take the ride through the Tower of Babel. Yeah, I think that's it for the day. There's your week in creationism, your, your update on what's happening in the creationist world. Hey, I'm Joel Duff. Uh, give me a subscription if you want to hear what's happening in the world of creationism next week. We'll be back. Thanks. Bye-bye.